So most of you, I think most of you certainly who have children are using the Devos on the go uh, the last several months. So I'm going to go over a couple of these Devos on the go that will be a point of reference for your understanding the sermon today. So who is Jesus? Remember the Devos for our families, right, with Christian education. Who is Jesus? After Colossians 1, you get to the second card, and it is Matthew's quoting, it's recorded in Matthew 3.17, of what the Father, the voice from heaven, says about Jesus after Jesus is baptized, right? You are my son, the beloved. So that's a key point for our sermon today. We're going to be over in Luke, but it's, it's the same thing with the Devos, right? Now then, this is really key. The next card, the very next card in the Devos on the go, give us Hebrews 4.14. And this is about Jesus being our great high priest and the fact that we can go to Jesus in prayer, okay? And, and so that's, that's there too. Jesus, our great high priest, our mediator to whom we turn when we pray. All right, so remember that. Parents, remember that as you unpack these devotions on the go with your children off of these cards that we gave you. Just remember these and these points of reference. So today we're going to be turning to several scriptures. As I've already mentioned, you want to remember the opening of the first servant song, Isaiah 42 also. Okay, now we're going to turn to Genesis chapter 1, the first three verses of the Bible to begin with our scripture reading for today. Genesis 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God, Ruach Elohim, was hovering like a bird flies. Okay, that's the language, that's the verb used there was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Then we turn to, we've already mentioned Isaiah 42, the opening of the first of the four servant songs in Isaiah that run from Isaiah 42 through Isaiah 53. Now we're gonna turn to the very end of the fourth servant song. The fifth stanza of the most, arguably the most important passage in the entire Bible. The fifth stanza of the fourth servant song of Isaiah. Isaiah 53, verses 10 through 12. Talking about this servant of the Lord who's been pierced for our transgressions. Like a lamb, sled, uh, a lamb led to slaughter. He hasn't raised his voice. He's died. He's been killed for our sin, in our place. But, but then, um, verse 10, final stanza, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. It was God's will to crush or to bruise this great servant of the Lord, this exalted one. He, the Lord, has put him to grief. When his soul, when the servant's soul, makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. Well, how's he going to do that? Because he's, he's been killed, but he's going to see. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall flourish in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, this, this servant, this lamb who's died for us, he shall see light and be satisfied. It's like he's going to rise again or something. Wow, this is amazing. By his knowledge, the righteous one my servant, Abdi, this is what God is saying now, will justify many, for he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, the Lord says, I will apportion to him the many, in other words, those who are elect, those who belong to him, those who are saved, and he shall divide the strong as spoil. Why? Because he poured out his soul unto death, and was numbered among the transgressors. 
Indeed, he bore the sin of many and makes intercession like the great high priest, okay? Makes intercession for the transgressors. Now then we're moving on to Luke's gospel where we're located right now as we make our way through Luke's gospel. Reed read the opening, uh, you know, chapter 3, verses 1 through 14 uh, last week. I'm just going to pick back up on verses 1 through 6, dig into that a little bit more with the message today. And then we're going to move ahead to verse 15. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee and his brother Philip tetrarch of the region of Isariah and Trachonitis and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, God's word came to John, ben Zechariah, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he, John, went into all the region around the Jordan, that means the Jordan River, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, this is from Isaiah chapter 40, the opening of Isaiah 40, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, that means God. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled. and Every mountain and hill shall be humbled, made low. And the crooked shall become straight. And the rough into smooth ways. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Now... Luke then goes on to tell us about John's ministry and what he's preaching about. And then picking up, Reed covered this last week, picking up at verse 15. As the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, John the son of Zechariah, whether he might be the Messiah. John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water. But the one who comes, the one who comes is mightier than I, of whom I am not worthy to untie his sandal straps. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. So with many other exhortations, he, John, preached good news to the people. But Herod, this is Herod Antipas, you don't hear him all through Jesus' ministry, Herod Antipas, the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by John for Herodias, his brother's wife. He's living in an adulterous marriage, so-called marriage, to his brother's wife. And for all the evil things that Herod had done, added to them all that he locked up John in prison. Now the big verses, 21, 22. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying... Heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form, like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. When God opens heaven, when God opens heaven, uh, you, you know, there's an old story about old Frank, old Uncle Frank, who lived here in Starkville back in December of 1941. And, you know, he read the newspaper on December 8th, uh, 1941, and they asked him what the news was. And he said, well, it looks like we may have a little ice storm later this week. And they said, no, 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 did you see the news? And he said, oh, yeah, the Bulldogs lost their basketball game. You know, they couldn't hit a couple free throws at the end of the game, and they lost. And they said, no, 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 Uncle Frank, did you see the news? What was the news? The Japanese just attacked Pearl Harbor. We're entering a world war. We're on the edge of entering a world war, and you're worried about who missed a basketball shot or, or the weather for later this week? You, you kind of missed 
the headline news, right? You know, you could fast forward that to nowadays. People are like, well, I don't know if Harry and Meghan are going to make the coronation or not or what, what the politics of that is or I heard about this or that about Joe Biden or about this or that. And Like, people are missing the news. And my message to you, coming from God himself by his word, is do not miss the big headlines of what is going on in your brief life on earth. It's not going on with politicians. It's not going on with ball players. It's not really about the climate. It's really about the maker of heaven and earth and his message to you and his invitation to you, to your family, to your children, to understand that he can open heaven for you and for all who are in Jesus Christ. When God opens heaven, don't miss the gospel. We're not here for long, my brothers and sisters. Don't miss the gospel headline. The gospel story lead headline in Luke chapters 1 through 3 is not, is not, we've gone through this, you know, the step up, step down parallelism. I've been going over that with you a lot. Is not, the main headline is not about John, son of Zechariah. Don't get me wrong, John, son of Zechariah, is highly important, but he's only the prelude. He's the warm-up act. He's the forerunner pointing to the big one, <laughs> the big news. Okay, so Luke 1 through 3 is not really about John, who's often called the Baptist, and those who followed him were called at the time Baptist. It's kind of interesting back in the first thing. It's not about the group of the Baptists, okay? It's about some, some folks and, and who have a, a much higher leader than him. Uh, it is about the coming of Jesus, son of, not son of Zechariah. Can you fill in the blank? It's there in the notes for you. Jesus, son of Zechariah? What do you think? I didn't give you much room for the blank, right? It's not Zechariah. It's son of God. The gospel story lead headline in Luke chapters 1 through 3 is about the coming of Jesus, the Son of God. The gospel story lead headline in Luke chapter 2 specifically. I know we love to sing about angels and shepherds, and probably most of the Christmas carols have even more about angels and shepherds than they do about Oh, some other guy in Bethlehem. But anyway, uh, it's not really, Christmas is not really, I know we love to decorate with the angels and the shepherds and the sheep and everything. It's not really about them. They're, I'm, they're important, but they're just kind of the warm-up pointers to the big story. The big story is about the birth of, as the angel of the Lord says, unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior who is... Mashiach, Christos, Christ, Kyrios, Lord, Christ, Lord. They go together. Fusion there, interesting, from the angel of the Lord. Like the Messiah is also God. And, of course, Savior really means God, ultimately. The gospel story lead headline in Luke 3 now, which is where we are now, is not John's baptizing. I know that in most even translations of the, English, of the Bible into English, there'll be a headline that says, this chapter is about John's baptizing. I know that. I know most commentaries spend most of their time talking to you about John's baptizing. Very important. But I'm telling you, that's only a warm-up act for the big story. Interestingly enough, now notice this as I read that scripture. John is referred to repeatedly in this chapter by Luke as son of Zechariah. He's never referred to like he is in some of the other Gospels as John the Baptizer or John the Baptist. I don't know if Luke had a thing against Baptist or what. No, I'm joking with you all. Okay? But the point is, he's really emphasizing, look, I'm not even going to give you that title because you need to look beyond him. This is what Luke is saying. If you can, can understand what I'm telling you, God's inspired word through Luke is telling you, look beyond the son of Zechariah. Okay? I'm not even going to call him John the Baptist. The lead headline in Luke 3 is somebody opens heaven. And who is it? Is it Lysanias, governor of Abilene? 
What do you think? Is it even John, son of Zechariah? No. You need to look a lot higher than John, son of Zechariah, to understand who opens heaven. God. God. Let me give you a little hint. In life, look up to God. Not to your latest political hero, or not somebody who just posted something, so I've got to send it out to all my friends because this is amazing on this vaccine issue. Or, no, no. Look to God. Look to God. So, uh, God opens heaven for God's Trinitarian communion. This is big stuff, Trinitarian communion. When you get the whole Trinity together, it's like a really big deal, the fullness of the unity of God. So what I mean by that, the Trinitarian communion. The Father and the Spirit in this moment when heaven is opened are affirming in other words, as the two witnesses, the Father and the Spirit, are affirming. Do you hear what I'm saying? The two witnesses, the divine witnesses, the Father and the Son, are affirming Jesus, the beloved Son, and anointing Jesus, the beloved Son, for his mission as the Savior, the Christ, the Redeemer. When God opens heaven, that's what Luke chapter 3 is actually about. That's the headlines. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch. In other words, um, when Herod the Great dies after Jesus is born, his, his kingdom, his little kingdom under the Romans gets divided to his sons. Okay, this is what this is talking about. His brother Philip, tetrarch, uh, the region of Ituriah and Trachonitis and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. Let me tell you what's going on here. Luke is giving you a very precise date stamp. Very precise date stamp. You see that? He's referring to, this is not by accident. If you know Bible numbers, this is not by accident. Seven, can you count them? seven earthly rulers. Got it? Seven officials. And he's giving you a date stamp on these guys. These are imperial. In a latter case, a couple of them are both imperial, you know, auspices, Jewish rulers, the high priest. So what this is saying, and kudos to Origen, our good friend from Alexandria, who with his sermons in the 230s BC, were some, excuse me, AD, AD 230s, down in Alexandria, he got this right. Origen really did. Luke is telling us already in Luke 3, related to this message about the heavens being opened, that the gospel is universal for all people. There is one gospel, there's one good news, there's one way to be saved for all people, and the message is not just for the Jews in Israel, it's for everybody. But it is for the Jews too. So you got five non Jewish rulers and two Jewish rulers. Full. The gospel is for the Jew first, but also for the Gentile. Luke just told you that in Luke 3. You don't have to wait for Paul to understand that. He just told you that with his uh, listing. The other thing is, let me make this clear this date stamp is almost unique in ancient literature. This is an extensive date stamp. You have to go to the Thucydides. Back several centuries earlier with, the Greek, with his Greek writing to get a couple of these kind of date stamps at this intensity. Yes, Josephus gives us some date stamping, other people, but seven rulers? Seriously? I mean, Luke really wants you to understand that Jesus is coming in precise historical world terms. Okay? And he's giving you the date stamp. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, he's telling you that Jesus begins his public ministry, bridging off of the introductory ministry of John, in either kind of straddling the years 26 or 27, A.D. 26 or 27, or 28 or 29. What I mean by that? Well, um, uh, Tiberius, when he began, uh, you know, after he was adopted as the son of Caesar Augustus, not, not the birth son, the, the adoptive son of Caesar Augustus, he had an informal co-regency with Caesar Augustus, Caesar Augustus' last two years of life, okay? So it depends on whether Luke is counting that informal, unofficial co-regency or not. 
you're looking at either basically around 27 when Jesus is going to begin his outright public ministry after the temptation, or 29. But Luke is telling you exactly when this is happening. I know in Luke 2 we get the Caesar Augustus and Quirinius, but that's a little more flexy. We don't know exactly when that is. We know per Matthew and the Herod the Great story that Jesus was born sometime before 4 B.C. Because Herod dies in 4 B.C. Okay, She's probably born around 6 to 5 B.C. Now, when he's roughly, you know, about to be 30 or a little over 30, Jesus is going to begin his public ministry. Luke's going to tell you that too. But he's giving you a really big date stamp. One thing I would note, because this is going to be a big deal, when, when in Holy Week, when we get to Jesus' preaching in Nazareth, he's going to say it's the Jubilee year, the year of the Lord's favor. And 27 is officially a jubilee year in the Jewish calendar. So it could be 27, could be 29. Jesus may just be speaking kind of prophetically, metaphorically. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, what does that mean? There's only one high priest. Well, Caiaphas is the son-in-law of Annas. Annas was put in power back by, you remember Luke 2, Quirinius when he was governor of Syria, like way back in 7 BC, he's deposed in around 15 AD, but he then has six people who work for him in the office of high priest subsequently. Five of his own boys, and this guy Caiaphas, who is the high priest at the time of Jesus' public ministry. These are going to be the two guys, Annas and Caiaphas, his son-in-law, who are going to be in charge when Jesus is crucified in Jerusalem. Um, so let me make this very clear. You need to know this. On the one end, Tiberius is considered a son of the gods by the Romans, just like Caesar Augustus was. He's considered divine. On the other end of this list of the seven, Annas and Caiaphas, they are both washed. You look this up in Exodus 29. They are cleansed, washed, okay? And they are anointed, as in other words, little m, messiahs. Okay, so the Hebrew word uh, for anointing in, in a ritual sense is mashach. And the person who is anointed is called mashiach, the anointed one. There are three offices under Judaism that are anointed offices. We had that in the confession today. Dean talked about it with the children, right? Priest, king, prophet. Well, what does all this anointing mean? It means this is the person that is set apart by God, or by the way, altars, and the temple are also anointed as the gateway, the axis point between heaven and earth. The gateway between earth to heaven the way heaven is opened up to us. The priest represents the holy presence of God to us as the anointed of God. The king represents the holy reign of God to us as the gate, the axis of God to us. The prophet represents the bringer of God's word, God's speaking to us. It's going to turn out that Jesus is all three of these things, only infinitely higher than any of these you know, human beings that get anointed. But you need to know that these guys, Annas and Caiaphas, are anointed to God. During the priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, God's word came to. Where's God's word going to come? Tiberius, he's the son of the gods. He's the most powerful man in the world. Even though he's off with prostitutes on his Isle of Capri, and he's... Uh, Desolute and everything, yeah. But, but yeah, but he's still the most powerful man in the world. And he paid hush money to cover up some of that stuff, you know, even though the Romans are trying to investigate him. He's the son of the gods. The word of God doesn't come to him. But the big whoopee guys, all right, the, the big highfalutin dudes, the high priest. I mean, this is, each of these guys is the Hakalain Hakadol. I mean, he is the high of the high. Each of these, the high priest. Does the word of God come to them? No. The word of God comes to some renegade son of a priest who's off where? 
Is he in Jerusalem at the temple? No. He's off in the boondocks, in the wilderness, in the desert. Like Israel needs to be totally restored and restarted. This is crazy stuff. God sends his word via John, and he's going to open heaven for Jesus. But notice, not at the temple. Heaven's not going to open up at the temple. Heaven's not going to open up in Jerusalem. It's going to be out at the Jordan River. You understand, sometimes the headlines are not what we think the headlines are. Like a lot of people miss this. Would you have known Jesus when he came? Or would you have been focused on your stuff? But tell me, are, are you in the spirit or not? Now all we're questioning in their hearts concerning whether John might be the Messiah, the anoint, like the capital M Messiah. Now you know the cross in the center of our sanctuary here. This, this cross that's right here, it has the opening letters for the name Jesus in Greek, the Oda, Eta, Sigma, right? But in some crosses from the ancient church, you've got the Cairo, and those are the opening letters of Christ, right? Christos, which is the Greek term for the Messiah. So they're asking John, are you the big one, the Savior who's going to come, that all the Old Testament scriptures keep pointing us to? Are you the Messiah? Because the Messiah was thought to be both a king but also a priest. So that kind of makes sense. He's the son of a priest. Maybe he's the one. John answered and refuted them all. I baptize you with water, but the one who comes is mightier than I, of whom I am not worthy to untie his sandal straps. In other words... John is taking you back to that opening of Isaiah 40 because the one crying out in the wilderness is preparing the way for the Lord God himself, not just a human being. Hear this? Make, way, make the path straight for the Lord God. So John is saying, look, I'm baptizing you with water, but God's about to come. God is about to come. That's what John just said. One, the one who is to come mightier, infinitely mightier than I. And, and he double downs on this, but he says this. He will baptize you in what? Holy Spirit. And what? Fire. Only God can do that. Only God puts Holy Spirit in people. Only God brings people alive in the Holy Spirit, and only God judges by the refiner's fire that determines whether you're going to heaven or hell. Only God does that. And John just said, the one coming after me is going to do that. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. That's what God does. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. Notice the way Luke puts that. You're sitting there saying, is this good news? Well, it's not like nice religion news. It's serious news, but if you understand about sin, death, and evil, it is good news because we need a Savior from this fallen and evil world. We need somebody who can restore God's justice and righteousness and holiness. And so it is good news. And then it's like Luke moves John almost off the stage. I mean, John is going to be there for Jesus' baptism, but Luke wants you to get your attention off of John. So he tells us this horrible story about Herod Antipas, you know, being persuaded to lock up John, and John's in prison. So John's kind of in, in the story, so to speak, off the stage. And then look at this. Now, when all the people were baptized, we got our eyes off John, even though he's there, okay? When all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying. Here's our answer. When does God open heaven? After Jesus is baptized, just like one of the crowd, and when he is praying, when he is doing what? praying. That's when God opens heaven. Okay. Um, to put this in perspective, after Jesus had come and joined the crowd of all the sinners to be baptized, self-acknowledged sinners, it's good, they're repenting. Do you like being in the back of the line? If you had premier seats, would you wait in the back of the line with the people who are just trying to get a pass to sit in the, the cheap seats? Would you? 
This is the Son of God. Catch this now. This is the Messiah, all these things I'm talking about. He's, he's everything I'm talking about. And he, the implication is, Luke says, he just joins the crowd and waits his turn. I mean, can you believe this? This is the humble, this is what it means to be with Jesus. This is what it means to be a Jesus person. He waits with the crowd of the sinners. Okay, so here's what he's doing. He is the Lord's anointed, the king. I mean, he's the one that, that Psalm 2 is talking about. He's the one that Simeon was talking about in his prophecy. He is the anointed Lord, divine son. That is, he is John's one who is coming after me, who's mightier than I, who will baptize you with Holy Spirit and with fire. In other words, God himself on earth. Here he is, and he is numbered among the transgressors, which is the point. He is fulfilling what I read to you from Isaiah 53. Do you understand this? He is numbered as just one of the crowd. There he is. Waiting his turn, and finally he gets baptized. And then he's praying, and he's in total submission to God's will, and that's when heaven opens. When Jesus was doing what? You can fill in the blank on the sermon notes. You know the answer, right? When he was praying. How often do you pray? For real. I want to invite you to revisit what prayer means today. I want to invite you to lead your family into serious prayer. When Jesus is very seriously and faithfully praying, heaven opens. As he prayed in perfect righteousness, trusting himself to his father's what? Can you fill in the blank? And that's not going to give me the answer. Can you fill in the blank when he is trusting totally in whose will? God's will. Will. That's the answer. What do we pray? How does Jesus teach us to pray? Thy kingdom come. Thy what? Will be done. Are those just some words that we slap out real fast? No. If you actually pray that, you need to meditate on that all day, all week, and all your life. Your will be done. I don't understand this. I know. Trust me, my son. Take my hand. But this is bad. The bad guys seem to be winning. I know. Take my hand. Trust me. Your will be done. This isn't what I wanted. Exactly. Your will be done. Trusting himself to his father's will, as Jesus faithfully began his public ministry, and specifically here, Heaven opens as he looks to begin his, what's called his Galilean and Decapolis phase of his ministry, which is going to run from Luke 4 through the middle of Luke 9. Heaven's going to open again. Got a heads up for you. At the transfiguration in Luke 9, as Jesus looks at the journey that takes him from the end of chapter 9 through chapter 19 of Luke, as he makes his way toward his exodus his crucifixion and resurrection at Jerusalem. Heaven's going to open again. God's going to reaffirm. Okay, both times. Um, the, the Holy Spirit coming in bodily form like a dove, this means it is visible. It's not just a thought. It's not just a feeling. This is visible. This is public testimony. And it takes us back to the reality that we are dealing here with the new creation. That's why I read Genesis to open for you. Okay, same kind of language. The Holy Spirit comes. Now, by the way, when uh, David is anointed, you can read this in 1 Samuel 16 by Samuel, the Holy Spirit rushes upon him. Now we've got the greater David, like the real, the real king is here. And so the Holy Spirit rushes upon him. It's serious. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. So here's our prayer. Here's our prayer. I've got it for you in the notes. Lord, please don't let me miss you. Don't let me miss your saving gospel. And don't let me miss my essential appointment on earth. You have one essential appointment this week. Only one. I know there's a lot of stuff on your calendar. You've got one essential appointment this week. You've got one essential appointment in your entire life. What is that? To talk to God and pray to God and yield yourself to God praying. Heaven opens when Jesus is praying, and Jesus invites us to pray with him in his name. With him in his name. 
And here's the good news. When you pray in Jesus, when you trust in the Father truly, by the power of his spirit, and say, your will be done. I don't understand things, but your will be done. I'm going to go with you, God. Heaven opens. And what I started with from Hebrews 4, let's go back to that. Hebrews 4. Since we have a great high priest, that's Jesus, the anointed one, okay, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. That means when I'm struggling, when I am struggling with faith and bodily issues and world issues, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin, even waited in the back of the line. The last shall be first. And then listen to this, verse 16. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. How am I going to draw near to the throne of grace? Because that's in heaven. We're talking about the holy of holies. You know, God Almighty. Because, do you get it? God opened heaven with Jesus. When I pray, if I really meet that appointment, I'm directly with God through Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace in heaven because Jesus has opened it up. God has opened it up for us that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Do you have need? Or you got it all, all figured out, planned? If you have need, he invites you up because God opened heaven when Jesus submitted himself as your Savior. And a voice, hear this good news, came from heaven. You are my son, my beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Christian, you pray in his name. Don't miss it. It's life. It's salvation for you and for your household. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.